everyone. We're back with the second episode of Women and Work: Why It Matters, a podcast brought to you by the International Center for Research on Women and Feminism in India. Uh, we are your hosts. I'm Purnima, and I'm Nilantana. And today we're going to be talking about domesticity and domestic work. So, Nilantana, you know, when I was thinking about today's episode and the fact that we're going to be talking about domestic work, I couldn't help but think about how in my home. domestic work is definitely of course you know considered a woman's job something that is expected to be done by my mother my sister or i but it is also so deeply gendered that even when uh, say a guest has come to my home and the only two people at my home are my brother and i my brother would come back and ask me to give the guests a glass of water or make tea for them or basically you know take care of them it is that gendered Yes, Pornima. You know, I can totally relate to that. I've had this. I've had a similar experience at home. And interestingly, despite my mother being a full-time working woman in the sense that she used to go out to office every day, she had the exclusive responsibility of household work. So we had a domestic worker, but the responsibility of supervision was always with my mother, not with any other person in the household. and you know sometimes i would talk to didi who was my domestic worker our domestic worker and didi would say that you know interestingly she would do the paid work in different households but she would have to go home and do the same work which is unpaid in her own household and she had small children and sometimes because of the work she did outside she wouldn't have time to really care for her children and despite that in her own household she was expected to do everything and take care of children take care of the household So I think it's a very very important topic that we are discussing today and we know that for generations domestic work and care work within the household which is usually unpaid has been the responsibility of women and girls this leads to double burden exhaustion ill health and inability to join paid employment those households that can afford it do employ paid domestic workers but such domestic workers are typically women from socially and economically marginalized groups who are paid a pittance and work under vulnerable conditions and the pandemic especially has had a major impact on households and domestic workers with no domestic help many women have been multitasking between managing work from home and household chores and care responsibilities meanwhile domestic workers were among the worst affected both economically and socially with some facing stigma losing their income for months and others dismissed from employment altogether so in today's episode in fact we're going to be exploring the link between domesticity and domestic work and joining us today is a very special guest Yes, yes. We have today with us Mubashira Zaidi, and I'm really, really excited to introduce her. So, Mubashira is a research fellow at the Institute of Social Studies Trust (ISST). In her research capacity, Mubashira has contributed to research and analysis in the area of women's economic empowerment, women's work, and women's struggles and women's claims-making processes. She's also a doctoral student at the Humboldt University of Berlin, Germany. where she is exploring the existential meaning and value of work for women in the informal sector. Mubashira has a master's degree in social work from the Tata Institute of Social Sciences Mumbai. So welcome Mubashira we are really excited to have you here with us. Thanks a lot thanks a lot Nilanjana and Purnima I'm quite honored to be here in fact I'm on such a important conversation that we're going to have today thanks we're so excited to be talking to you today Mubashira so I think um uh, with this we should start the episode so in our last episode we talked quite a lot about paid and unpaid work and I think that's how I would like to start our discussion today as well Uh, so, Mashra, how do you think women negotiate paid and unpaid work, and what role do domestic workers play in that? We've also heard about time poverty. You know how double burdens, etc., leave women with no time for leisure. Uh, can we unpack this a little more as well? Uh, so, this uh, we actually need to understand that um, the reality of uh, most of the women in the informal sector in India. is that the work in economic distress um the um, the stories that you were talking about your life uh, uh reflects that and uh, they have very few and uh, limited uh, decent paid work opportunities available to them majority of women are found in work that is known as uh, 
uh, low skilled or uh, unskilled you know uh, precarious forms of work with very poor working conditions uh, and we also know how the social structures uh, defined not only by gender but caste culture religion uh, migrant status uh, so on uh, also have a bearing on the kind of work that is available to a woman and uh, they are bargaining or they are negotiating power is also defined by these economic and social uh, circumstances um at the other end of the continuum is the uh, unpaid work and care work that women are primarily responsible for and undertake for their own household so um so women belonging to uh, you know to the informal sector usually live in lower income settlements may not even have affordable or uh, easily accessible or quality public services that increases the burden of uh, providing care to their own families so uh women uh, you can imagine are stretched at both ends um you know of the spectrum often not recognized enough uh, for their contribution and lacking the uh, support structures that they could uh, fall back on uh domestic workers uh, have played a key role uh, uh in bringing some relief to uh, women who work uh, who, who belong to the middle class or the upper classes and um, and it has introduced care work as a commodified service um uh, so uh, you know with with the coming of domestic workers and increasingly we see more and more women joining the the sector there is a shift from care as unpaid labor within the family or uh, home or, or you know to to paid labor being offered by families especially in middle and upper income classes in urban areas uh time poverty uh yes uh, is a uh, is a measure uh, you know that represents the extent of work uh, undertaken by an individual in a day or, or you know or in uh, um or different activities across different seasons and uh, we see that um, you know so if, if there is high time poverty it could mean that uh, there is hardly any time to uh, rest uninterrupted or uh, you know or if there uh, you know there is no discretionary time for yourself uh, which naturally has implications for uh, a person's well-being um, resulting in uh, lasting health impacts uh, 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 it becomes quite real for women in the informal sector and especially for for instance uh, you know in the case of domestic workers where there are low wages and women have to do many more households uh, to uh, you know to earn a certain income and have also to perform their own unpaid tasks in their families time poverty is uh, high and in our research at ISST we have seen that women express a lot of physical and mental stress around that Uh, but there's an, uh, also another thing that we uh, we realized in our research uh, is that uh, there is a common belief and women are also uh, you know party to that belief in uh, in seeing themselves as uh, having um, unlimited resources or time uh, you know and driven by love and care for instance so uh, they they think that they can do each and every task that comes their way whether it's paid work or unpaid work and we call that time stretching or resource stretch resource stretching so time poverty although an important measure it does not uh, capture certain qualitative or subjective implications that the burden may have uh, another instance is there is uh, uh, you know when women perform tasks whether paid or unpaid there is a lot of overlapping of other activities you're watching over the child as well as cooking it is labor intensive you know so it does not have that function or principle of economies of scale uh, you know um there is uh, you know limit it's limited by uh, you you cannot be mobile when you're working on, on uh, when when you need, when you're doing care work it also has an ambiguous character uh, in the sense that uh, it has uh, you know it can stretch over a direct physical work physical care to emotional care and interestingly it is also interactive so the output uh, of this uh, uh, of you know care provision and care receiver the output of care is dependent on who is receiving the care and who is giving the care so it's interactive yeah yeah 
and uh, that's that's where you see uh, you know um, the difficulty in 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 capturing the uh, experiences of domestic work a domestic workers experience in the in, in other people's home and in your own home i know mubesh right i think you made some really important reflections and this brings me to my next question where uh, i want to look at a little bit uh, into the complex relationship between madams and maids for example when you are talking about this act of giving care and when a paid domestic worker is involved in the act of giving care then sometimes this relationship extends beyond the pecuniary it be- extends beyond just the contractual obligation and we we have read a little bit about that but even in the other context that you are looking at uh, cleaning cooking and the other kinds of domestic service that paid workers are giving what happens is that there is a relationship of mutual dependency that is created between the madam and the maid so for example often you know women in the middle and upper income household a little part of their time is freed up because of the presence of these care workers domestic workers at the same time for the domestic workers you know they also depend a, la- a lot on the madams and the employers for support beyond the wages so if there is a problem with education of the children or ill health of the family they often come to the madams for loans or for advances and stuff like that so there is a relationship of mutual dependency there is also a very interesting shared relationship of let's say that experience of being primarily responsible for you know domestic and care work so just like the madams the maids are also responsible for unpaid domestic work at home in many ways so there is that united and shared experience at the same time they are divided by class and caste and by an employer and employee relationship so just wanted to hear your reflections on this very difficult and complex you know relationship and what comes of it do these lead to oppressive conditions for the paid uh, domestic workers or are there other ways of looking at this relationship today yeah um in fact um the the case study of domestic workers is is quite interesting and we learn a lot from that uh it it not only uh, i mean it brings forth not just the social power structures inherent in gender but the domestic work sector i mean um uh, it we you know it's feminized but uh, it also throws open myriad other conflictual social relations of class caste migrant status and even uh, even it, i mean it also questions the uh, the private sphere uh, as uh, you know how the capitalist view the home as a private sphere and uh, no market transactions happening there so it brings into question a lot of such uh, relations uh now the women of the household the madams uh uh mostly play a key role of protecting certain boundaries or intimate spaces uh, of the house and the tools that are employed uh to uh, you know to have a relation with the domestic workers or in a way uh control the domestic workers to uh, you know in accessing these spaces are these very um, you know these uh, relations of class caste uh, religious positions or perceptions of purity and impurities uh whether domestic workers are uh, are hygienic enough or are are they carrying dirt or viruses um so the ideologies of you know being feminine or you know domesticity or um, or around care work that the women of the household hold uh, has been crucial in shaping the interactions uh, with the domestic workers and experience of the domestic workers or even access to work so uh, in our interactions with domestic workers during our research this uh, more than uh, the negotiations on wage or how skilled you are these are the kind of things that they uh, do share with us uh, the idea is that the domestic workers um, have to be trained or brought, brought to the level of the household for the care tasks uh, that are to be performed um, but uh, but uh, the complex thing is uh, i mean it has to remain in certain boundaries uh it is um uh, although uh, the care tasks have to be performed in a way that the uh, that the women in the household want but there is still a certain distance that has to be maintained between uh, the women of the household and uh, the domestic worker who is seen as a foreign person uh, and uh, 
uh, you know, and women of the household are the domestic or uh, belonging to the private space. So, uh, as the female subjects of the house, I mean, they're they're responsible for the aesthetic and cultural and social reproduction based on their social status. In this interaction between the employer and the domestic worker, uh, what is brought into question is this unskilled nature of domestic work uh, or care work. You know, which uh, we say it's found naturally in all women, and we see here how each household uh, is training that uh, same woman again in the in the care tasks that are to be performed in each household. It also points out to the character of the care work, um, which is you know, which I was saying it's interactive between the care provider or receiver. The tools that domestic workers uh, have are also the same. They, um, uh, you know, that they employ in their negotiations with the women of the household. Uh, of course, it is the knowledge and the skill uh, of performing these tasks, but also these symbolic m- markers of who is a good domestic worker. So honesty, obedience, uh, cleanliness, quick learning abilities, and also other caste-based or, or, or cultural and religious expectations. Um, um, also, uh, we have seen that the language of uh, worker rights or strategies of collectivization, which is you know, which is slowly sleep- seeping in, um, but um, are still not used that much with uh, you know uh, when domestic workers engage with uh, you know with uh, uh, with the em- with their employers, uh, and uh, but uh, and they're more prominent when uh, you know when. Uh, they are migrants uh, rather than uh, live in. In fact, uh, in our research, we have not been able to reach out uh, much to the uh, to the live in uh, domestic workers, but especially uh, the migrants or uh, you know live out, live out domestic workers. Uh, so this, uh, like you said, it's a very cl- complex relationship, um, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, it's it's really uh, I- interesting. Um, you know, although there is this dependency between the two sets of uh, people, um, uh, we haven't really had a chance to uh, uh, do our research with a lot of women in the uh, upper or middle class homes to discuss how they see the domestic workers. But uh, the domestic workers themselves see this as a patronizing uh, sort of a relationship. They, uh, for example, in in one of our COVID studies where we wanted to understand the impact on domestic workers, one of the domestic workers shared with one of our researchers that they called me beta, beta, daughter. And uh, when it came to, uh, you know, no jobs or no income and I was suffering, my family suffered, there wasn't enough care. I was not considered their beta. So what is this relationship that I have with them? So, um, so it's a it's it's a, it's a matter of convenience. Um, I feel uh, for the uh, for the employees of the or, or uh, the employers basically uh, to to use domestic workers uh, as semi family members when uh, when it comes to uh, you know these are uh, informal ways of uh, uh, controlling domestic workers. Uh, rather than um, rather than establishing a long term uh, you know beneficial relationship that was very insightful Vashna. and speaking of domestic work being perceived as feminized labor i think uh, nilanjana and Vashna, you'd be surprised to know that around one in every seven additions to the female workforce is actually a domestic worker and domestic workers are covered under the unorganized sector so they don't have regularized working hours as well as minimum wages or other social protection mechanisms. Uh, The COVID-19 pandemic, keeping in mind how devastating it has been for a lot of communities, what has been the impact of the pandemic, especially on domestic workers? Uh, We know there was a widespread uh, loss of jobs and income. Uh, In case of living workers, there was less uh, uh, impact on jobs and those women who had uh, fewer care responsibilities at home uh, and uh, uh, I mean those ho- households who could uh, accommodate them did employ them as in uh, you know live-in workers uh, but uh, on the same um, on the same uh, income on the same salary uh, so, uh, but uh, during the lockdown, we saw that uh, all the domestic workers were out of job and maybe the time poverty uh, would have uh, lessened in their case. Uh, but uh, 
uh, since there was um, uh, since they were not covered by any social welfare board uh, they had uh, absolutely uh, no income from the state uh, to fall back on uh, they had to uh, more many of them were migrant workers and did not have the kind of documents needed to access food from pds and because of the digital divide they did not uh, they were uh, not very comfortable uh, you know applying you know using e mechanisms to access food so uh, and since women are primarily responsible for nourishing children or providing food in the family they they were the ones who were going out to collect food also because um, the amount of violence that the men were facing uh, by uh, you know there was police harassment uh, during the lockdown so women were basically going out there and accessing food uh, or or collecting food for the family so that work had definitely increased for women um we uh, we also saw that many of the workers uh, decided to migrate back to their uh, villages uh, because at least there they could access the pds system or there was manrega but in our research we also heard many women saying that we do not have anything in the villages also I mean, we don't have a house we don't have a land and uh, so while many migrants decided to leave some of the domestic workers said we do not have anything to go back to so we'll have to stay here and uh, and uh, and had were in debt uh, and they still continuing to pay their uh, uh, to pay off their debts uh what um, has come out of this is that uh, there is because we know that uh, mobilizing domestic workers and collectivizing them has been a huge challenge for the women's movement and uh, the um, there was this realization that we could uh, uh, those women who were connected to ngos and collectives did receive help so there was this realization that while we do not have state support or uh, uh in comparison to say construction worker women who did receive cash transfers there was some benefit in collectivizing and becoming a member of um, you know different uh, organizations who were helping out domestic workers uh so at least there was some realization to that effect um we also uh, and those those women who have continued to uh, now uh, who have uh, come back as domestic workers or who are already working there also uh, faced uh, this additional stigma uh, of being uh, you know carriers of virus or disease and that they were living in dirty settlements or uh, not uh, and putting themselves at risk rather than uh, i mean they were not perceived as uh the ones who were at risk going to different households but they were seen as um, people who were bringing risk to their employers so that realization also became strong that uh, the employers so this relationship of dependency could not be i mean it shattered that dependency that my madams will help me when i am in crisis that was also shattered that because there were these uh the it the social distancing practices uh and um, it, um and the the loss of job and income and the fact that the madams could not come in or the households could not come and provide that continued help uh, uh this shattered their belief that you know there is this dependent relationship and i could be helped with kind and stuff like that so it um, in a way it, it was a greater realization for domestic workers for the women's movement themselves to collectivize them further also it uh, you know the, the e shram portal for example that has come up uh, has also asked i mean has also identifies the domestic workers as one sector that needs uh, recognition and registration so there are certain things that uh, you know the the plight of domestic workers uh, actually Uh, unfortunately now help to uh, recognize uh, you know their status and uh, you know that there is a need of uh, legal recognition and uh, social security thanks mubashir i think that's uh, that that's really important to know and uh, you know like i feel that covid has actually brought forth a lot of realizations uh, for example you said that you know at one point this whole facade of mutual dependence has also been broken and it also enabled i think greater uh, collectivization uh, efforts 
at the at the other end of the spectrum many households which were very much dependent on these part time live out domestic workers during the entire lockdown period when these domestic workers could not come to these households or later because domestic workers were as you said perceived as carriers of virus you know they were not allowed to come to these households in that context these households had to manage all the domestic work and care work by themselves and at the very first instance what happened was that all the madams or the women of the household had to take on the entire burden but in some cases what also happened was the men of the household and the other members of the household also came forward or maybe could be expected to come forward to share this work and this at least visibilized the importance of domestic and care work so in your uh, research and in uh, you know your uh, experience what do you think in during the covid period do you think that there was a greater sharing of household work between women and men and what is specific to this idea of masculinity that actually makes men feel that this is not our work um in our earlier research where we try to understand uh, uh, how do women balance uh, paid and unpaid care work although this was prior to covid but in situations where uh, women are not available or are burdened with care and there are certain care tasks that have to be achieved uh we uh, did this in both urban uh, settlements and as well as rural rural areas to understand uh, what happens when b- women uh, decide to do paid work outside their families so how you know to to see if there is a change in uh, social organization of care within the household we realize there are certain situations in which uh, or or there are certain spaces where uh, negotiations uh, happen one was child care uh, we realized that uh, men uh, of the family were more willing to uh, contribute uh, contribute their time to child care uh, and, and so there was a space there to negotiate and uh, and uh, demand uh, a greater uh, contribution there so child care was something that the men were still willing to do uh, for children although the quality of care or direct care differed uh so while uh, men uh, were willing to do uh, simple tasks uh, say uh, cooking rice instead of rotis for instance or um, you know uh, or preparing noodles rather than something else so uh, but th- there was this space of negotiation which could be widened also uh, the structure of family plays a key role uh, uh, if the family is nuclear uh the women had a greater uh, bargaining power in the family um also gender composition if there were a greater number of women in the household and there was a greater sharing that happened and of course it uh, uh so then the contribution of men was the same as before but uh, there was a greater sharing of work that happened within the family um now, but that would also mean that uh, uh girls uh, or younger girls or there was higher sibling uh, care or uh, you know unpaid burden of um you know performing the task in the family on girls um uh we uh, so this this but this is our research uh, on informal uh, sector families um i assume there will be similar practices uh, in in the middle classes and uh, you know anecdotes uh, are uh, you know what we understand from uh, um from our interaction with domestic workers and our own observations is that there is a higher uh, expenditure that is being done on appliances or uh, you know to uh, save uh, lab- you know to save labor of women so uh, for example uh, roti makers or microwaves and uh, things that will or uh, even dishwashers uh, there was an increase of uh, so to uh, so it wasn't like the men then decided to wash dishes they uh, they would probably spend more in uh, buying uh, such uh, uh, you know appliances that would help uh, care work within the family uh so these were the uh, kind of uh, changes we did see um 
uh, of course uh, uh, we still don't know whether uh, you know in case of informal workers whether you know public facilities and services improved because that was a huge issue during the lockdown and uh, uh, or or crash facilities and because uh, the crash facilities are still uh, and uh, you know is a huge issue for for the informal sector workers and even for upper and middle classes and that has not opened so child care is uh, something that can i mean the appliances cannot do uh, uh, you know care of uh, children and their other pressures are closed down so the men did uh, contribute more uh, in terms of watching over the child and uh, or the elderly and sick in the household but uh, things like cooking and cleaning were still um, tasks of uh, women and gender norms are some things that uh, is is a thing that is really sticky and uh, uh yeah i mean there are ways to uh, uh change power dynamics but uh, hardly you no know, i mean it uh, hardly shifts yes uh, you know mubashira all that you say i mean resonates so much with whatever we have also seen i think personally around us even in middle class households and uh, by the way this has been a fantastic discussion and i think we have learned so much and we have covered so much ground and i was really struck uh, for example in the beginning of our discussion when we when you talked about time stretching as a concept and it's not just time poverty but sometimes there is this much that has to be done and no matter what you have to stretch time somehow to accommodate all that you have to do and you're constantly multitasking and i think this leaves i mean this leaves people physically and mentally exhausted and that does um, leave a mark in, as as you grow older you know this this continuous exhaustion of every day and interestingly this is a job which has no holiday so it's every day and 24/7 so i think that is a very very important point that you touched upon and i was also thinking about uh, you know the discussion we had on this very complex relationship between madams and maids and contrary to how we look at domestic work as something that you know women are born to do they naturally you know learn i mean the moment they are born they actually know how to cook how to care and something very internal and very um, essential to womanhood so and and but if we see how uh, there is a training that has to be done of domestic workers in middle class households this actually this fact itself contradicts this sort of uh, Uh, this belief and we know that how uh, this training plays a very important role not only in creating certain kinds of skills but also in manufacturing a certain level of obedience in manufacturing a certain body language and also manufacturing the distance that one has to maintain right uh, how domestic workers need to keep themselves somewhere distant from certain spaces so yes they are a part of the household yet they are not really family they are semi family which as you said is a is is in a way an informal way of controlling domestic workers so you want them to feel like family so that they do everything lovingly at the same time you also want uh, they are not part of the intimate circle and that distance has to be maintained not only because they are employees but also because they come from very different social locations their caste their class positions are very very different and uh, you also said that you know sometimes i mean i remember during my own research with domestic workers many of them saying ki nahi nahi wo to hame bahut pyar karte humko beti mante hain humko didi bulate hain ya you know that and i think covid has been an eye opener because in so many households that as you have shared that that mutual dependency or the fact that the you know many of the domestic workers also realize that no we are not getting this support so actually it is not a relationship of care we are not a, a family together because they are not really supporting us in the most difficult times of our life and we are actually not being paid even our wages we are not being allowed to come into our these households we are being seen we are being stigmatized so there has been that disillusionment and that probably as you also pointed out will help in the uh, evolution of that language of rights it is precisely this notion of being part of an intimate circle which sometimes prevents this articulation of the language of rights ki nahi wo to hamare apne hai to hum kaise 
राइट्स लैंग्वेज कैसे लाए वहां पे कैसे बोले कि ये हमारा अधिकार है सो आई थिंक दिस दिस सॉर्ट ऑफ दिस रेजोल्यूशन दिस 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 यू नो अंडरस्टैंडिंग और दिस रियलाइजेशन दैट नो देयर इट इज अ कॉन्ट्रैक्चुअल रिलेशनशिप वी डू एंड दे हैव नॉट रियली केयर्ड फॉर आवर लाइक फैमिली so it is important for us to at least assert our rights and this may help in the future collectivization process and uh, yeah i think the final points and I, again i was really thinking about uh, the 100 years of feminist history and how whenever we talk about reorganization of say domestic and care work between men and women or how every member of the family needs to participate in this process the the quick fix solution becomes technology Okay, okay. You are, there's too much burden on you. Okay, let me get a pressure cooker. I remember those ads in my childhood, where you you know there was this. There used to be this ad where the husband, I mean, the ad said that if you love your wife, you should give her a pressure cooker. <laughs> so ultimately, the responsibility is the wife. But if you want to ease her burden, give her a pressure cooker. Now it's the dishwasher or the roti maker or whatever it is. But yes, as you also said, that perhaps in certain contexts. there has been a greater negotiation especially with respect to child care at least people have started speaking about this there is a cognizance that this is the reality and we need to talk about it is a very very important work so yeah on that note i just want to say it seems so wonderful i wish we could go on and on but we are at the end of the episode so thank you so much for all your insight and in the next episode actually we'll be discussing a little bit more about informal sector because as you said uh, you know a lot of these workers are actually part of what we call the informal economy where there are no uh, social security uh, uh, mechanisms where uh, often minimum wages are also not assured there is no security of job and for many of these households the conditions of work become extreme extremely critical for their very survival so i think in the next episode we'll unpack a little bit more in detail about the informal economy yes and thank you so much but before we end uh, today's episode i would just like to take a moment again to thank you mubashra for joining us today and giving us a chance to talk to you it was so great talking to you and since you shared such interesting details about your work i just wanted to give our listeners a chance to go and find more about the very important work that you do uh so where can they do that uh yeah first of all thank uh, thanks to you to to i mean uh, it's been uh, i mean especially the reflection that you shared in london and the end uh, i think it was excellent and it shows your own experience and knowledge behind this uh more information now uh, you could definitely look at our website which is www.issd.org uh, Uh, issdindia.org and then we also have a new uh, twitter handle of issd and also a facebook page so uh, we have most of our publications up on the website though great so to everyone listening if you've enjoyed today's episode which i'm sure you have you now know where you can find more about mambashra's work and before we go just a small reminder don't forget to subscribe to women at work white matters on your favorite podcast streaming platforms we will meet you again in the next episode like nilanjana mentioned where we will talk about the informal economy and find out how it relates to women in work the women in work white matters podcast series is part of the rebuild covid-19 and women in the informal economy project the study is being carried out in kenya uganda and india by the international center for research on women with support from the bill and melinda gates foundation and the international development research center This podcast is brought to you by the International Center for Research on Women (ICRW) and Feminism in India (FII). You can find more about ICRW's work on their website, that is www.icrw.org/asia, and find them on Twitter and Facebook at ICRW Asia. You can also find more about FII on www.feminisminindia.com or follow FII on Twitter. Facebook and Instagram at feminism in India. So thank you so much for joining us today. We'll see you in the next episode.